there in a special way. It's for our Amazing Facts Canada broadcasts. We do broadcast Amazing Facts programs in Canada, and so these programs will be used in Canada and will be broadcast on their national TV stations there. So we want to uh, just encourage uh, Pastor Bachelor and Karen and the rest of the team up there as they finish up this special evangelistic effort. I want to thank the prayer. We mentioned in the prayer about those who are suffering as a result of the fire not too far away from here. And, uh, it's just devastating when you think of uh, a whole town almost wiped out so quickly in one night because of those terrible, terrible fires. Uh, I am encouraged by the response from the church. Uh, last Sabbath, I understand there was a special message put out to the church members. Anyone who was able to help bring some supplies, and they took it up to those who were affected with these fires. And we want to thank you for your generosity in helping to provide as much as we can for those who are need. And let's keep the folks in prayer and then also do what we can to help, as I'm sure it's a long way to go to recover from this uh, tragedy. Over the past few times that I've been sharing with you, we've been looking at the book of Hebrews, and today we will continue with our study of the book of Hebrews. I think it's a fitting topic that we find in Hebrews chapter 4, especially today when we see so much happening in the world around us. It can be rather discouraging, but the Bible does give us a promise of rest. And the Apostle Paul in Hebrews chapter 4, in a special sense, emphasizes the rest that the believer can find in Jesus. A little bit of background to our study. We've looked at the position and authority of Jesus in chapter 1. We spoke about the purpose of the incarnation. Uh, we've, in the past two programs, we've spoken about a rest offered for the people of God. And this is setting the stage for chapter 5 through 8, the emphasis of which is Jesus, our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. We'll then be looking at uh, the high priestly ministry of Jesus in chapter 9 and 10. And then finally, there is an appeal to live by faith and obedience. And then the final greeting that the Apostle Paul has there in Hebrews. So our focus today is Hebrews chapter 4, rest for the people of God. We begin in verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. So in the Bible, we find God promising a special kind of rest for those who come to him by faith. The promise of rest, symbolized by Canaan back in Old Testament times, was given to Israel at the, ti at the time of the Exodus. But because of unbelief, most of those who left Egypt did not enter into the land of promise. Paul reminds us that God's promise of spiritual rest still remains, and that by faith we can receive that promise. I'm sure you're familiar with the story, the children of Israel. They are led out of Egypt, and they travel in the wilderness, and they come to the borders of the promised land. And before actually crossing through the Jordan, they send out spies into the land. And the spies go up and down the land, and they look, and they bring back a report. They bring back some of the fruit of the land. And they give the report that this is a beautiful land. Indeed, it is running with milk and honey, as the Bible had portrayed. All kinds of wonderful fruit. But also in the report that is brought back to the children of Israel, Ten of the spies talk about the giants in the land and the fortified cities in the land, and they discourage the congregation. So much so that the congregation, they say, well, we can't enter in. And there's even a murmur that begins to take place amongst the congregation. They become very angry with Moses and Aaron. But you have Caleb and Joshua. They were two of the spies that also went into the land. And they say, no, we can take the land. God has given it to us. And that's what we find in Numbers chapter 14, verse 8, where they said, If the Lord delights in us, then He will bring us into this land and give it to us. But the congregation turned away from the council from Caleb and Joshua and decided to go with the council of the ten spies that said, We can't go in. They got so angry that they gathered up stones to stone Moses and Aaron, and the glory of God was manifest from the sanctuary, which kind of halted them. In their ambition to get rid of Moses, they wanted to find another leader that would lead them back to Egypt. So we find a lack of faith in God providing what He said He would do resulted in the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years before being able to enter into the land of promise. Verse 2 says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, and the them there being the children of Israel. 
In the Old Testament times, the gospel was preached through symbols and ceremonies. Uh, there were different forms. The message, however, was the same. And that message at its core, righteousness by faith. That through Jesus, we can receive forgiveness and cleansing and righteousness. The whole Old Testament sanctuary service was teaching this important truth. Psalm 77 verse 13 says, Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. It was through bringing the sacrifice to the door of the tabernacle and the father of the home laying his hand upon the head of the lamb symbolizing the transfer from himself and from his family to the sacrifice, the lamb symbolizing Jesus who would die for our sins and then also the ministration of the priest in the holy place and once a year in the most holy place illustrated the work of salvation, the work of ministry that Jesus would do for those who have faith in him. The last part of the verse says, But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. When the gospel is received by faith and implemented into the life, then it is profitable and nourishing, and we can find that spiritual rest that the Bible promises. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we have this very important verse. Paul says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith, we can't do the things that are pleasing to God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, when the verse says that we must believe that God is, it's not just talking about acknowledging the existence of God. James tells us that the devils believe and tremble, but that doesn't help them. It's more than just acknowledging that God is there or that God exists. To believe that He is, is to believe in what God says about Himself. You see, God says, I am love. We must believe that when we come to God in prayer, that He loves us. He's concerned about our needs. He wants to help us. He wants to give us rest. Sometimes we get the idea that God is up in heaven and he's looking down on us and because we don't always do the right thing, he's an angry God looking for opportunity to kind of get even. But that's not the picture of God that the Bible portrays. The Bible describes a God who is interested in us, who is reaching out, eager to save, wanting to help. So first of all, we need to believe that God is who he said he is. God is love. Secondly, we must believe that he will hear and answer our prayers not because we are good, but because of our need of Him and He is good. So if we choose to enter into the rest that God wants to give us, we need to believe that when we come to God in prayer that He hears our prayers and that He's able and willing to help, to help us in our time of need. In the book Steps to Christ, we have this beautiful statement. It says, yes, only believe that God is your helper. He wants to restore His moral image in man. As you draw near to him with confession and repentance, he will draw near to you with mercy and forgiveness. Sometimes we are tempted to think, well, I can't really come to God because, well, I, I, I'm not good enough to come to God. Or maybe I need to first fix this area of my life or gain some victory with some struggle before I'm willing to come to God. But the reality is we will never have true victory or true peace until we come to God. We can't make ourselves good and make ourselves acceptable in the sight of God. We must come to Jesus just the way that we are. It is His goodness that makes us acceptable, His goodness that cleanses and washes us. Verse 3 says, for we, have be, for we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now again, Paul is using the illustration of the Israelites as they came out of Egypt. They went to the promised land. The promised land was a symbol of the rest that God wanted to give them. Because of a lack of faith, because they doubted the promises of God, the children of Israel were unable to enter into the rest that God wanted to give them. Paul says, but we believe, those who believe in Christ, who come to God in faith, to them the promise is given, you shall enter my rest. So there's a special rest that God has for those who believe. Because of unbelief, the majority of the Israelites who came out of Egypt were unable to enter into that spiritual rest offered to them by Jesus. And of course, in the New Testament, we find that same invitation given to us by Jesus 
Come to me, all he that labor and are heavy laden. And what does Jesus promise to give us? I will give you rest. Everybody needs rest. We all need physical rest. But even more importantly, we need spiritual rest. We need rest because rest brings peace. And peace brings confidence in God. We need to experience that peace, as the Bible says, a peace that passes all understanding. Even in the midst of trial or difficulty, we can still have rest in Jesus. Like Jesus, there on that boat in the midst of the Sea of Galilee, tossed by the wind and the waves, Jesus was able to rest. He was able to sleep in the midst of that storm because he had perfect confidence in his Father. That's the experience God wants each of us to have, to have this spiritual rest that gives confidence that God will do what God has promised to do. We need not fear because Jesus is our Savior. Then it goes on in the verse and says, Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now here's an important point. Paul now introduces the Sabbath and uses it as a symbol of the spiritual rest that God wants to give us. So first of all, Paul says, the children of Israel, they came out of Egypt, they went to the borders of Canaan, they were unable to enter into the rest, the physical rest of entering into the promised land because of unbelief. He then says there is a spiritual rest that God wants to give, but in order to enter that, you need to have faith in God, you need to believe in Him. Now, Paul says the seventh day Sabbath is also a symbol of the spiritual rest that God wants to give us. And we go to Genesis chapter 2 to read about this. I think we're familiar with actually studying about this in our Tuesday evening uh, Bible study. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had done. He rested on the seventh day from all the work which He had done. Verse 3 says, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it He had rested from all the work which God had created and made. Now, there are two principles I want you to bear in mind. First of all, God worked for six days and then He rested on the seventh day. Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day and the very first full day that they had was a day of rest. Then they went and worked. So God works first and then He rests. Man rests in the work of God and then he goes forth to work for God. Before we can work for God, we need to rest in the work that God has already done for us. So when we come to God by faith, it's not our goodness or our good works that make us accepted to God. We rest in the work of Jesus. Then we are empowered to do work for Jesus. Something else interesting to note about these three verses. What were the three things that God did for the Sabbath? Well, the first thing says He rested on the Sabbath he then blessed the Sabbath. And what's the third thing he did? He sanctified the Sabbath. To sanctify something means to set it apart for a holy use. Now those th same three things that God did for the Sabbath, God wants to do for us. Does God want to bless us? Absolutely. Does God want us to have spiritual rest? Absolutely. Does God want to sanctify us or make us holy? Absolutely. So the three things that God did for the Sabbath are three things that God wants to do for us. But we by faith need to enter into that rest. And we're going to talk about how we ought to do that. Verse 4 says, For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. So now Paul is quoting from the Old Testament, and he does that many times in Hebrews. Remember the audience that he's writing to primarily were Jews. They trusted the Old Testament writings. You'll also notice that most of what Paul quotes in the Old Testament comes either from one of the first five books of the Bible, the books written by Moses, or the Psalms. Those are primarily the sources that Paul uses. And in the mind of the Jew, the writings of Moses, the first five books, as well as the writings of David, the Psalms, had great authority in their understanding and their thinking. They believed all of the other scriptures inspired, but in particular, the law spoken of by Moses and the writings of David held great influence and sway amongst the Jews. So Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy, he quotes from the Psalms, and he's talking about a rest that is provided for those who come to Jesus. So the Sabbath then is a memorial of creation 
but it is also a continual reminder of the spiritual rest that God wants to offer mankind. Verse 5 says, and again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Once again, it's referring to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt because of a lack of faith. They were unable to enter into the land of Canaan. They were unable to have physical rest, a type of the spiritual rest that God wanted to give them. Paul quotes now from Psalms 95 verse 11 to show that Israel's failure to enter into God's rest was because of unbelief. You can also read in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 29, this is after the children of Israel had received the law. Moses had gone up into the mountain. God had written down his law on tables of stone. And as Moses came down from the mountain, <laughs> the children of Israel, they had pretty much rebelled against God. And there was this commotion in the camp. And they were rebelling, worshiping the golden calf that had been built. And Moses took those tables of stone upon which the law was written and he threw it down onto the ground, symbolizing the children of Israel. They had broken the covenant. They had broken the law. And of course, there was a judgment that came upon Israel. There was a cleansing of sin from the camp. And then finally again, God told Moses, make tables of stone and come up onto the mount. And God wrote down his law with his own finger. And after all of that, and God thundered and they heard the voice of God, the children of Israel finally responded and said, okay, everything that God has said, we will do. They actually said to Moses, Moses, don't let God talk to us anymore. It's kind of fearful. You go talk to God and then you come tell us what God said. And so now the children of Israel acknowledge, yes, they need to keep the commandments. And they say, yes, everything God has said, we will do. After the children of Israel say this, then God said to Moses, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments that it might be well for them and their children forever. So the children of Israel said, Yes, Lord, we'll do whatever it is you want us to do. Please just don't hurt us. And don't speak to us. Work through Moses. And God says, But you've missed the point. Oh, that you had a heart within you. Oh, that you were motivated by genuine love if you had that holy fear or reverence then it would be good for you and your children. Why did the old covenant fail? Because it was based upon man's promises saying all that God has said we will do. The new covenant is God taking his law and writing it in the heart. The two great principles of love for God, love for our fellow man, that's embodied in the Ten Commandments. And that's what God wants in order for us to enter into this rest that involves genuine conversion, a change of heart, having the principle of God write his law, the principle of the law God writes in the hearts of those who believe. Verse 6 says, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, talking about the rest, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disbelief, despite the unbelief of ancient Israel, the invitation to enter God's rest still remains, but those who desire to enter his rest must do so by faith. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Now the first part of this, verse 5 says, that we need to not lean on our own understanding. You see, often when it comes to us obtaining victory, spiritual victory in our life, we often rely upon our own understanding or our own experience. I've counseled folks before, had a, a real addiction to alcohol, and I would try to encourage him and say, you know, you can gain the victory. God is able to give you the victory. But instead of taking God at his word, they rely on their own understanding and they look back in their past and they begin to recount all the times that they tried to quit drinking and how many times they fell. And to them, it seems a total impossibility that they could ever gain the victory because they're relying upon their own understanding. When we come to God in faith, we are not to look to our own understanding or even our own past experience, but we are to look to Jesus, for with God all things are possible. So when the verse says, don't trust to your own understanding, don't look to your own experience or your past, but look to the promises of Jesus. For with God all things are possible. Acknowledge Him, acknowledge His power and what He can do. Trust in Him, then He will be able to direct your paths. It's a day-by-day -day experience in coming to Jesus.
Verse 7 says, again, he designated a certain day, saying in David, Today after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So the promise of rest was first given to the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt. But because of unbelief, even though they eventually did enter into the promised land, they weren't able to enter into the spiritual rest that the promised land symbolized. Now Paul says, even in the time of David, the invitation was still given to the children of Israel to enter into this rest. And then he quotes and he says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So even some 400 years after the Exodus, still the invitation is be given to Israel, enter into the rest that God wants to give. Although the invitation to enter God's rest had been neglected by those to whom it was first given, the invitation was repeated through David some 400 years after the Exodus. And of course, it continued all the way up to the time of Christ. Even during the ministry of Jesus, Jesus kept giving the invitation, come to me. Primarily, the focus of Christ's ministry was the Jews, and then after Christ's ascension for another three and a half years, the invitation almost exclusively went to the Jews to enter into the rest that God wanted to give. One day the disciples asked Jesus, if my brother offend, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? And Jesus said, no, not seven, but how many? Seventy times seven, that's 490. It's interesting to note that God had a 490-year time period of probation that he had given to the Jewish people, beginning with the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, all the way up till 34 AD when Stephen was stoned. The invitation was going to the Jews over and over again, inviting them to enter into the rest that God wanted to give them. But with rejection of the powerful sermon given by Stephen three and a half years after Christ, Finally, as a nation, the Jewish people turned away and chose to reject the rest that could only come from God. And as a result, we see in 70 AD, anything but rest. You had the Romans surrounding Jerusalem and the city being completely destroyed. Now, of course, the invitation for rest, even though it was rejected as, uh, from the nation as a whole, the individual invitation is still there. And there have been and there were many individual Jews that responded to the invitation. But not only is the invitation just to the Jew, but in New Testament times, the invitation is to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The everlasting gospel now goes to all the world with the invitation given by God to enter into this rest, this spiritual rest that Jesus wanted to give to Israel, but because of unbelief, they would not enter in. Now the invitation is given to spiritual Israel to enter into that rest that only God can give. Verse 8 says, For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. In other words, Paul is just emphasizing that the rest that God wants to give is more than just physical rest from their enemies or the land of promise, the land of Canaan. It's a spiritual rest. The fact that Israel was in full possession of the land of Canaan in the days of David makes it clear that the rest here referred to was not the occupation of Canaan, but the glorious spiritual rest that God wanted to give. Still the invitation is today, God wants to give us this special rest. Verse 9 says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Now the Greek word used here for rest is sabbatismos, which means a keeping of a Sabbath. So even in New Testament times, even for spiritual Israel, the Bible speaks of a keeping of a Sabbath. Paul has already referenced the seventh day Sabbath, and he said that's the day that God rested, that God blessed, that's the day that God has sanctified. Now he tells us even for spiritual Israel or for the believers in Christ, there still remains the Sabbath rest. So every seventh day Sabbath, we are to be reminded not only that God is our creator, but that he's also our recreator, that he wants to bless us. He wants to give us rest. He is the one that sanctifies us. And that's what's been illustrated in that verse. And we can also see this illustrated in the miracles that Jesus performed. In Luke chapter 13, verse 16, it says, Jesus speaking to the religious leaders who were criticizing him for healing people on the Sabbath, he said, So ought not this woman, 
being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Now, in the Gospels, we find seven Sabbath miracles that are recorded that Jesus performed. Each of these Sabbath miracles illustrate a further truth of what the Sabbath represents and the rest that Jesus wants to give. The first Sabbath miracle that we have recorded, you can read about it in the book of Mark. Jesus is in Capernaum. It's the Sabbath day. He's actually preaching in the synagogue, and there is a man with an unclean spirit that comes and disrupts the service, and Jesus casts the evil spirits out of the man, and the man finds rest and joins in in worshiping God. So the Sabbath is a rest from even those evil chains or influences that seem to bind the soul. Jesus can give us rest. He can bring deliverance. Straight from that worship service, Jesus went to Peter's house, and his mother-in-law lay sick with a fever, and Jesus uh, gave her health. He healed her. And after she was healed, the Bible says she went about ministering for Jesus and his disciples. What happens after we receive the spiritual healing that only Jesus can give? Well, then we get involved in working for Jesus, ministering to the needs of others, sharing the gospel with others. On another occasion, Jesus was in a church and, uh, or a synagogue, and there was a man that had dropsy. Dropsy is when the legs begin to fill up with fluid, especially around the feet and, and the ankles, so much so that a person can't even walk, and it's extremely painful. And here was this man that could barely walk, and Jesus saw him and saw his need. Jesus healed him on the Sabbath day and made some of the religious leaders upset. But it's interesting to note that in order for us to walk aright, to walk the Christian life, we need healing from Jesus. On another Sabbath, there was a man that had his arm all withered up and his hand all twisted. Again, Jesus healed the man, told him to stretch out his hand, and immediately his hand was made whole. Before we can do the right thing, we need Jesus to heal us. He has to change our hearts. Otherwise, we're motivated by selfishness, and selfishness doesn't work. It must be love. On another occasion, Jesus was in Jerusalem, and he was walking along, and he stopped at a pool of Bethesda, called the Pool of Bethesda. There was a man that was paralyzed. He had been there for 38 years. Terrible condition. And Jesus went to the man and said, Do you want to be made whole? And the man said, but Lord, he didn't know it was Lord. He just looked up and saw Jesus and said, but I have no one to carry me and put me into the water. And then, of course, Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And when the man, by faith, chose to obey the words of Jesus, then the miracle occurred and strength came to his arms and his legs and he was able to stand up and do that which before was impossible for him. The lesson being that when we come to Jesus and the Lord says, what do you want me to do for you? And we say, Lord, I want to be made whole. As we take God at his word, as we exercise faith in obedience, then the miracle occurs and we're able to live a life that otherwise we couldn't live, a life of obedience without the power of God working within us. And then the final seventh miracle we read about Jesus performing on the Sabbath was also in Jerusalem. There was a man that was born blind. And the disciples were wondering, is it because this man sinned? Or it must have been his parents that have sinned if he was born blind. And they were somewhat concerned about this. They couldn't understand it. And they asked Jesus. And Jesus says, not because this man's parents sinned or he sinned, but rather that the works of God might be revealed. And then it says, Jesus made clay spat on the ground, he made clay, he anointed the eyes of the man and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And in obedience to the word of Jesus, the man went down and there were many steps from the temple area down to the pool of Siloam in the Kidron Valley. He went all the way down, he washed the clay from his eyes and he could see. You see, Jesus wants to bring us spiritual healing to our spiritual eyesight. Before we can sense our need of Jesus, he has to open our eyes so that we can see what it is we need. 
So through the Sabbath and through the miracles, we can see illustrated the rest that God wants to give us. Verse 10 says, For he who has entered into his rest has himself also seized from his works as God did from his. Again, God worked for six days, rested on the seventh. Adam and Eve were invited to rest that first Sabbath and then they were to work. So we rest in Jesus, then we are enabled to work for Jesus. Upon entering into God's rest, the Christian looks to Christ for his righteousness. Paul is again connecting spiritual rest with the seventh day Sabbath. In our family worship, we've been reading through the book Desire of Ages and uh, for opening the Sabbath uh, yesterday afternoon, we were reading the uh, chapter of the birth of John the Baptist. And as we were reading along, this paragraph really jumped out at me, and I thought, oh, I've got to include this in the sermon for this morning. And here it is, talking about the birth of John the Baptist. It says, The birth of the son of Zacharias, like the birth of the child of Abraham and that of Mary, was to teach a great spiritual truth, a truth that we are slow to learn and often forget. So what is the lesson that we can learn from these miracle births? Now, there are more than just three. But these three are rather interesting. Of course, when it came to the birth of Isaac, you know, Abraham and Sarah, Sarah was well past the age of bearing children. Uh, Isaac was a miracle birth. When it came to uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, again, Elizabeth was well past the age of bearing children. It was also a miracle birth. Of course, with Mary and the birth of Jesus, that is clearly a miracle birth. So there is a lesson in this that God is trying to teach us. And here's the lesson. In ourselves, this is the lesson we often forget. In ourselves, we are incapable of doing any good thing. But that which we cannot do will be wrought by the power of God in every submissive and believing soul. Now, of course, Paul says in Hebrews, there is a rest, but you need to believe. You need to come to God in faith. The last part of that says, it was through faith that the child of promise was given. It is through faith that spiritual life is begotten and we are enabled to do the works of righteousness. It is through faith in Jesus. Verse 11 says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So after the children of Israel, because of a lack of faith, did not enter into the promised land, the Bible tells us they wandered in the wilderness and they fell, their corpses fell in the wilderness because of unbelief. So Paul again, he's saying, let's learn from their example. Let's have faith. Let's enter into the rest that God wants to give us. The generation to whom the promise of rest was originally given failed to enter in because of unbelief. Paul now shows that the promise of entering into God's spiritual rest remains valid and that the Christian should labor to enter into that rest. Now that might sound a little bit strange. God wants to give us rest. And then Paul says we must be diligent to enter that rest. Another translation, we need to labor to enter into that rest. So how do you labor to enter into rest? You would think rest is stopping your labor. But there is a work that we must do in order to enter into God's rest. What is required of us in order for us to enter into God's rest? I think it's beautifully presented here in the book Steps to Christ. This is the work that we must do. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that is ever to be fought. The healing of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. What is the work that God wants us to do in order for us to enter into His rest? We must submit ourselves to Jesus. We must die to self. Yes, it is a struggle from time to time, but if we wish to receive the grace and the peace and the rest and the power that only God can give, we must daily surrender ourselves to Him. The Apostle Paul had to do this. Paul wrote, I die daily. Every day Paul had to come to God and say, Lord, I submit myself to you, my plans. I surrender my all to you. That is the work that we must do. And as we submit ourselves to God, as we surrender ourselves to Jesus every day, that enables God to do a work within us, both to will and to do according to His good pleasure. Thus, we begin to experience the rest, the peace that only God can give. Verse 12 says, For the Word of God is living and powerful, 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and to the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You see, when we're talking about the surrender of self, when we read the Word, when we prayerfully consider what God has asked, we begin to realize how powerless we are and how much we need Jesus. As we humble ourselves, as we surrender ourselves, then it is that we see Jesus must save because we cannot save ourselves. And that's the power of the Word. The Word reveals to us our true condition. It also reveals to us a Savior who is able to help us to give us that peace and that rest. Yes, the Word of God is powerful. There's a power in the preaching and the reading of His Word. I heard a testimony of a man who, his wife was a good Christian. He never believed much about Christianity. He said, oh, the Bible's filled with fables. But his wife kept saying, you know, you've got you to gotta give God a chance. You've got to try. You've got to try God. Well, he went through some real trials in his life, some, some big challenges. And, and finally, he, he said, all right, things can't get any worse than they are. I might as well give God a chance. And he prayed and he said, all right, Lord, if you're real, if you're real, I need your help. And he said, I'll, I'll do this. For the next 30 days, I will read the Bible for one hour every day. And at first, when he started reading the Bible, he said it was a real chore. He had to kind of discipline himself to sit down, carve out the time, and spend an hour just reading the Word. At first, he was reading things that he thought was just fable. But as he kept consistently reading the Word, he began to sense a power in the Word. He began to see Jesus in all His glory. Uh, the way he tells the story, it's beautiful. He says, at the end of those 30 days, I was a changed man. I found Jesus, the power of the Word. And I think that's where it starts. If, if we're struggling with surrendering ourselves to Jesus, if we're struggling to enter into that rest, let's start with the Word of God. As Paul says, it's powerful. It can change the heart. Let's commit to spending time in God's Word every day. Allowing the Word of God to do the work that the Word of God can do. A number of years ago, we were doing an evangelistic series in India, and we had a number of villages that were participating in our meetings, and so people would come each night from the villages. We had a big group. They were coming, and we were preaching, and these are people who grew up with Hindu religion, and they worshipped just all of these different gods and they had all these stories and all the strange belief but but they came to the evangelistic meetings and for 30 days we just preached the word of God near the end of those evangelistic meetings we were invited by one of the villagers to come and visit them one of the things they wanted us to do was to come pray in the homes of the folks who were attending the meetings there were many that were sick and they wanted us to pray for them. Well, we went to one of these villages, and there was a group of us, and the villagers were there, and they were so excited to have us, and they were leading us around and showing us different things and asking us to pray for the different families. I remember we went to the center area of the village, kind of a little open clearing, and off to the side there was a big pile of broken down rock, some of which was painted. And the person that was leading us through the village, they stopped by this pile of rocks, and they pointed to it, and they said, these used to be the gods that we worshipped. But now we've come and heard the Word of God. Now we worship the true God. They gathered up all their idols and broke them and put them in a big pile. We don't need to worship the idols anymore. We've experienced the power of the Word of God. There is power in God's Word. We receive rest by simply coming to Jesus and spending time with His Word. Verse 13 says, And there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. When we look into God's Word, especially into God's law, and into the life of Jesus, conviction begins to take hold of us. We begin to see ourselves for who we really are. That's why it says the discerner of the thoughts. We begin to realize that we're sinners and we need a Savior. We begin to realize that we need rest and that that rest can only be found in Jesus. The first step to finding spiritual rest is recognizing our need of Jesus and coming to Jesus just the way that we are. Is this still an important truth for the church to bear in mind today? 
to the church of Laodicea, Jesus says, because you say I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and you do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He says, I counsel of you, buy of me gold, refining the fire. What does that gold represent that Jesus wants to give us? Faith and love, a change of heart. I counsel of you, buy of me gold, refining the fire that you might be rich. White raiment, what does the white raiment represent? Christ's righteousness, both imputed and imparted. White raiment, that you might be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve. What do you suppose that eye salve is? Spiritual discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's like the clay that Jesus made and put on the man's eyes. And his eyes were opened and he was able to see. He was able to see Jesus. He was able to see his need. Then Jesus finishes up his discussion to the church of Laodicea by simply saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in unto him, and I will dine with him, and he with me. You see, Jesus wants us to open the heart's door to him, to come to him in sincerity, to humble our hearts, to say, Lord, I need you, to believe that God is, that he's a God of love, believe that he hears our prayer, that he's able and wanting to help us. As we come to him in faith, we get to experience fellowship with Jesus. And in fellowship with Jesus, there is peace. Verse 14 see, says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold our confession. When we see our need, we are not to give up in despair, for Jesus lives. He is our high priest, our advocate with the Father. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus understands. He knows what it's like to suffer temptation. He knows what it's like to go through trials. He knows what it's like to be human. And Jesus says, I can help you. I know what you're going through. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Come unto me and I will give you rest. Having taken our nature, Jesus is able to sympathize with us in our weakness, our difficulties, our temptations. He's able to help us in our time of need for he is a merciful high priest. Revelation chapter 11 verse actually Revelation 11 not 3 Revelation 11 1 says then I was given a reed like unto a measuring rod and the angel stood saying rise and measure the temple of God the altar and those that worship therein. Now you might be wondering what does that have to do with coming to Jesus? Well in Revelation chapter 11 John is given this measuring rod and he's told to measure the people who are worshiping in the temple. You can see there on the picture that is an ancient measuring rod. It was unearthed in Egypt about a thousand years old before Christ and that was used to measure things. Typically it was used for building. And so here in Revelation chapter 11 John is described as having a measuring rod and he is to measure the people that are coming to be worshiped. Now that parallels with what we find in Revelation chapter 14 when it says, Fear God, give Him glory, the hour of His judgment has come. It is a measuring. What does it mean to be measured? To be measured by Jesus is to come to Jesus just the way that you are. It is to acknowledge your sin and say, Lord, reveal to me those parts of my character that are out of harmony with your will. It is to submit ourselves to Jesus. Those who come to Jesus to be measured are the ones who are cleansed, who are transformed, who are empowered. And this coming to Jesus, this measuring, this judgment that the Bible speaks of, it's not a one-time event. You don't just go to Jesus to be measured once, but it is a day-by-day -day experience. We come to Jesus every day. We are to submit ourselves to Jesus every day. We are to confess our sins every day. We are to allow God to do a work within us every single day. And as we come to be measured, Jesus is able to cleanse and heal and transform. The gospel invitation is come to Jesus. He is our high priest. The doors on the sanctuary in heaven are open. By faith, you can come to Jesus even now. Those doors will not remain open forever. For a time will come.
When Jesus will say, he that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. The door of probation closes, but it has not happened yet. So the gospel invitation is to go to all the world. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He can heal. He can cleanse. And he can give you rest. Verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and found grace to help us in our time of need. If we make it a habit to come daily to the throne of grace, that is to come to be measured, for a fresh supply of God's mercy and power, we will experience that spiritual rest that God has promised to every sincere believer. You see, it's not about how good we are. It's simply about our willingness to come to Jesus. It's God's goodness, not our goodness, that makes us acceptable with the Father. The request is come to Jesus. Every day, make that your first priority. For the Bible says we have a great high priest. God is a God of love. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of power. All things are possible to him. Yes, come to Jesus. That's the great invitation. Well, I hope that's your desire. I know that's mine. Every day as a Christian, our work is to lean on Jesus, to lean upon that everlasting arm that sustains and gives us strength. And we're going to sing about that. That's our closing hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. I'm going to invite the song leaders to come forward. Let's stand as we sing our closing hymn together. It's hymn number... In number 469, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine. Don't you love the words of that song? Amen. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Not occasionally leaning, but leaning every day on Jesus. We cannot fail if we're leaning on Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your grace, your goodness. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for a sanctuary that is open in heaven, that even now we can come and allow you to do a work in us that only you can do. Father, help us to believe your word, to believe that with you all things are possible. Lord, help us to surrender ourselves to you every day, to just give you our all and trust that you will take us, you will work within us. Thank you for your promise, Lord, to never leave us nor forsake us, and we commit ourselves into your keeping. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We have some brief announcements. So again, we just want to invite anybody that wants to stay by for...